as Dan mentioned, I'm responsible for smart force development at AMT. It's a kind of a cute word that we coined in, I think, 2010 uh, to demonstrate that we need a smarter workforce in coming into careers in manufacturing, not just education and workforce development. So um, in my role at AMT, I work with uh, a, a lot of very professional people that do really great things. We have advocacy folks and technology folks and, and data statistics folks. You probably know AMT best if you've ever been to the IMTF show, show of hands, anybody ever been to that big show in Chicago? And in my role in Smart Force Development, I'm responsible for the Student Summit at IMTF, so I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later too. Um, right around 2010, AMT produced something called a Manufacturing Mandate, which puts in front of the people on Capitol Hill the things that we focus on as a trade association on behalf of our members. And those three things are incentivizing R&D in new products and new technologies. You see a lot of those new technologies here at Mazak. Uh, most people aren't really familiar with the fact that AMT also manages the MT Connect Institute. We have folks on staff at AMT who do that and liaise with people like the folks here at Mazak who are very strong with the MT Connect standard and helping their customers develop applications around MT Connect. So you'll see plenty of those things out there. Uh, we also focus on improving global competitiveness for US companies. So AMT has a tech center in China, in India. We have staff in Brazil and Mexico. So that we're helping US companies sell their products to other countries. And then the third leg of the stool that we focus on with our manufacturing mandate is what my team focuses on, and that is smart force development, building a better educated and trained workforce. All right. And to accomplish those goals, what are the things that we do? Uh, support policies, grants, scholarships, and challenges in STEM and STEAM. Uh, not just because my wife is a high school art teacher, but we, we know that engineers really have you know sort of an artful design mindset so we do advocate for the a in stem so steep uh, we implement national manufacturing skill standards as dan mentioned i'm on the executive committee of the board of directors of nims the national institute for metalworking skills and you might think of nims as an organization that does uh, standards and credentials for machinists production technicians and field service technicians. But over the last few years, we're going into new areas, new areas of trans transformational technologies. I'll talk about those things a little bit later too. And then um, we support CTE, everybody know what that is, career and technical education schools. So that could be high schools, it could be technical schools. Um, I've worked with a lot of community colleges locally and at the statewide level in a number of states and then we really obviously want to focus on engineering programs at colleges and universities too we advocate for uh, community college students and engineering school students to do an internship with a manufacturing company even an apprenticeship where it's applicable um, you know, just to give you some background the year that i was born my father was an apprentice tool and die maker so being uh, in a family around manufacturing and understanding what apprenticeships mean is part of my DNA. We need to get back to the point where apprenticeships are part of US manufacturing DNA. Again, it's a really important aspect of a smart force development solution. Dan mentioned that the new numbers that came out from NAM this week show that about 476,000 jobs are open. We can't fill them because we can't find the people with the skills that are necessary to do those jobs. This number uh, was taken from last month. So that number fluctuates uh, from month to month. It's, you can get this report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. You may have heard you know, around the time of the financial meltdown that there were 600,000 open positions in manufacturing. 
that we couldn't fill. FedEx Lee never got up to that high of a point, even though the economy was in a great recession and people were out of work. It was a number that got picked up by somebody that said it and it got repeated in the media and the general business press, but it actually never got that high. We have never been worse than where we are right now, so recently 476. The key thing is that um, it looks like the picture is going to get worse before it gets better. Um, a recent survey by Deloitte and the Manufacturing Institute stated that by 2025, there could be 3.4 million new jobs and transformational technologies that are needed, and the skills gap could be about 2.5 million. So it's going to escalate really quick. This number came out, I think, in early 2018. It's, it's getting a little bit worse. Um, part of the reason is that our workforce is aging, right? So the generations are retiring right now, the baby boomers that are, re are retiring at a rate of about 10,000 baby boomers every single day. Not every month, not every week, but every day. 10,000 baby boomers retire. And a lot of those folks are engineers and they work in our industry. I mean, you, you can look around this room, see a lot of guys that look like me, some of who may have a little bit more hair than I do, but you know, we're, we're aging as a workforce. So how are we gonna deal with the loss of that technical knowledge that's walking out of the door? We've simply gotta change perceptions about careers in manufacturing and get more young people interested in jobs in our industry. Um, eight, uh, this number really stuck out to me. 88% of employers say that if they could retrain, retain their existing workforce, they would choose that as a HR solution to their skills gap over anything else. It's always good to have those people with the innate knowledge of your company still working. Um, but the fact is they are quite Companies, if given the choice, uh, would retrain their existing workforce or have that workforce retrain new people coming in. So if you develop an apprenticeship program at your company, you're going to want to use those people that have the ne legacy knowledge of your industry to teach those apprentices. Right? Apprentices, if, if you're not aware, it's a dual training program. You're using the school system nearby, typically a community college, and those workers at your company to help train those individuals. 54% of companies do internal technical training programs. Uh, Roy Gorsby, Roy Gorsby's here. So Roy is responsible for that at, at Mazak. And um, a lot more companies should be doing that. I mean, we have to take some responsibility of our own to solve this skills gap, right? Part of the, part of the reason is that as a country, we've sort of lost our willingness to invest in the next generation workforce in our company. We do that because we're really bottom line oriented, but we should take the example of European countries and, and uh, Japanese countries and, and really focus on the next generation workforce, doing apprenticeship programs, things like that. So the question is, what percentage of companies will add apprenticeships to their companies going forward. That's really a key, as we see. Um, this next slide to me has an interesting title. So notice that it says, changing the face of manufacturing. It does not say the changing face of manufacturing, because we are not there yet as an industry. Uh, we need to focus a lot more on underserved and underrepresented communities. You know, I mentioned one of the biggest things that we do in my department is the Smart Force Student Summit at IMTS. Really important, that shows in Chicago. So I spent a lot of my time working in the Chicago community with Chicago Public Schools, the City Colleges of Chicago. And that is a community of folks that we just have to get interested in jobs in manufacturing. Again, look around the room, we don't look all that diverse in this industry. We've got to change that. Uh, very important to work with 
women in STEM and women in manufacturing. So we invite them to participate in the Student Summit. And I do a lot of work with these organizations too. Um, <coughs> returning military veterans. Right now, only 4% of our workforce is made up of military veterans. And if you're not aware, or if your HR folks are not aware, there are specific military occupation specialties that map really well to job functions within our industry. And if we would just reach out uh, to, there's a lot of organizations out there like Orion International and others that specifically try to place uh, military veterans into industry. Those folks go to other industries very readily. Uh, we just don't reach out to them enough in our industry to attract them. You may have heard on, on the news this week that in the state of Oklahoma, they released uh, about 400 prisoners on early re release. The, the ability, to, that's gonna happen across the country too as, as we take a different viewpoint on uh, incarcerating people uh, for the types of different uh, crimes that they commit and they're, you know, they're lessening their sentences. So 400 people in Oklahoma were just released uh, from prison, but they have no, they've got no safety net. And there are a lot of organizations around the country that are, you know, trying to help people who have been incarcerated to get them in jobs in different industries. Manufacturing should be looking at that audience of people too. And then I, as I mentioned, as we're seeing all these aging folks walking out the door, we've got to focus on retaining our legacy workers. You guys uh, are mostly from the Northeast, right, and Southeast. Anybody recognize the, the face that's up on that screen right now? Nope. His name is Jack Kemp. So wow. he, he uh, ran for office in the, in the 90s. He was a congressional representative uh, in the 90s. He's a former Buffalo Bill football player. And when I was a senior in college at Miami University, which is just across the river and into Southern Ohio. Jack Kemp came to speak at Miami. I went to his session and he said something that stuck with me uh, to this day. And oddly enough, I'm working in this industry and use this as a tool. What he said when I was a senior in college was, 25 years, 50% of the jobs that exist today will no longer exist then. So think about that. Think about when you were in college and how technologies have transformed our economy, our workspace, all of those things. Now, since I graduated from college, the car phone turned into the cell phone. You know, we're, we're using the internet using email. Uh, we have the industrial internet of things these days. MT Connect is really important uh, to what you do in collecting data on the shop floor. So if you step back and think about you know, how things change, it, it, it'll just blow your mind. Uh, I remember sitting in a, in a theater just like this, listening to Jack Kemp, and thinking to myself, well, my dad's been a tool and die maker all my life. I can't understand how he might get pushed out of a, a job doing that. And actually, he never did. He actually retired from GM and had a great career and put my sisters through college too, and everything was great. My mom was a legal secretary at the time, running a, a small law office, and things definitely did change in that space over the next 25 years. She would things like that. Um, but it, it's, it's really sort of bizarre when you think about it. And I, I've got a couple of examples that I can share with you. Anybody remember what this thing is? Did you have a Sony Walkman when you were younger? Um, I, I heard just at, at the end of the summer that it was the 40th anniversary of the Sony Walkman uh, new product invention coming out. And this really transformed how we listen to music and we're able to 
carry it in our pocket and that sort of thing. Um, I saw this new news article that was the 40th anniversary, so I went into my my personal technology museum, which my wife, my wife would like me to pitch from the uh, from the attic, but I just can't get rid of all these things. It does not have Bluetooth, and, and Dan, that's a really good point. As I was looking at this thing, I looked at the uh, the audio connector, and you know, it's only been recently that we, well, we've had Bluetooth at the phones for a while, but only recently did, Sean tell me, did Apple come out with these that changed the way that we, that we listen to music on our phone and take phone calls and, and things like that. So just a few examples of how technologies have changed and we know what that looks like on the shop floor too. I, I put this slide up here because I think it's really interesting to, to look at that. By the way, does anybody know what the generation before the baby boomers was called? The silent generation, the silent generation that's it. Um, I think the written, has anybody heard Gen Alpha yet? Is that, yeah, so this was new to me too. Uh, that's, that's a more recent one, obviously. If you take a look at the date rate, on those generations, the thing that stands out to you is over time, they become compressed. And why does that happen? The impact of technology on those generations. Right? So the generations are only considered to be about 15 years long now. It used to be much longer than that with the baby boomers and Gen X. The silent generation was even longer than that. This thing came out right here. This is our, an original iPhone, launched in 2007. This device, within its first three years of being on the market, created a million new jobs in what was then called the iOS economy. So, really good demonstration of how things change, how jobs change. And that's the big reason, right? There's an app for that. So we can do things differently that we didn't use before. And now the iPhone has become a, a deep or Google phone if you prefer a particular about which one you, you like. But we're all using apps to hopefully make our jobs better. But sometimes it just causes us to work a little bit longer every day, too. Right? Has anybody seen this? before Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So we have needs for the physiological, for safety and security, for a sense of belonging, a uh, sense of self-esteem, and then we get to self-actualization. Uh, there's a new Maslow's hierarchy that I thought was kind of comical. It's, you gotta have Wi-Fi and battery to make all that stuff work too. So that's, that's kind of where we are uh, as a society. And Wi-Fi and battery are going to become even more important over the long term. Um, Cisco is making a, a huge investment into 5G, which is going to be really important to how we use technology on the shop floor, uh, how we use MT Connect as we're you know, collecting data from the machines as they're running, understand what they're doing, how we can be more, more productive with those machines. Um, put this number up there, the Organization of Economic uh, Developing States states that 14% of jobs in, are highly vulnerable to automation. We at AMT take a little bit different view from that. This is you know, sort of the uneducated view, I would say. We, we kind of tend to agree with what the robotics industry says about the impact of automation on jobs. And that is, for every robot that's been sold in the U.S. over time, has created five new jobs in design, manufacturing, sales, service, back office support. Certainly, a robot may displace a job, like an automotive paint application individual, or you know, if you 
familiar with Lincoln Electric. They also do a lot of welding with robots on you know, car frames in the manufacturing plant. Those are jobs that are not highly skilled, that really humans don't want to do. So better to replace that job with a robot and because that allows humans to do really cool things like develop robotic applications that can make all of our manufacturing lives a lot easier. These changes that we're seeing in, in our world with transformational technologies is gonna require that we're all on a path of continuous life learning. When you think about that, you've probably already been on that path already. I mean, how, how many times do salespeople go and get new product training? How many um, of you are trained on a new software platform at work to do your job? It's all about continuous life learning. The maker movement that exists today in the U.S. is going to create a, a whole new cadre of entrepreneurs and workers in the gig economy. It's going to have an impact that we can't measure right now, but it's, it's definitely going to have an impact on how people do their jobs and where they do their jobs. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Industry 4.0 and the impact of smart manufacturing on jobs in our industry. Um, you know, this is called the fourth industrial revolution. Industry 4.0 is really sort of a very European term. In the U.S., we call it smart manufacturing. It has to do with the industrial and internet of things. I know you folks are working on these things every day in, in your world, so don't need to go into a, a lot of detail on that. The point is that it's also gonna create a need for a manufacturing workforce, or not O2. So that's something that we work very closely on in uh, my role in NIMS, the National Institute for Metal, Metalworking Skills. Uh, lots of new innovations and new technologies coming forth. So AI is going to be have a big impact on, on where jobs go in the future. Machine learning is really important. Collaborative robotics, human machine interface, all of these things. Um, we're working on new standards and new credentials for jobs in all of these areas right now because this is where the jobs are going to go. And Dan's aware we have a lot of data analysts who work on staff at AMT right now. If your companies don't have data and scientists and analysts working there, they will be soon. So Jack Kemp said that in 25 years, 50% of the jobs would, would be displaced and new jobs would be out there. The World Economic Report just came out last year said by 2030, 65% of the jobs that exist today, 2018, will disappear by 2030. That's just 10 and a half short years or less uh, away. 65% of the jobs are going to change. So how are we going to keep up with that kind of change? Um, we see education and, and workforce development trends changing. You know, I mentioned that we're responsible for the Student Summit and IMTS. Last IMTS, we showed education what we think the manufacturing technology classroom of the future looks like. So there's a lot of AR, VR in there. We had seven different augmented reality, virtual reality applications on display in the Student Summit and IMTS to show educators and administrators and students what they're going to be the technologies that they're going to be using to learn uh, different industries over time. Uh, two of the AR VR applications that were on display were actually developed by high school students. So it gives you an idea that this next generation coming up is really uh, acclimated to technologies and, and very willing to use them. If you guys haven't stopped by the AR VR tech, I guess it's just AR, right? AR technology that Mazak's got on display out here. There's another demonstration at, at four o'clock today. Uh, before I came into this room, I had the headset on 
and it's really interesting to put yourself in that augmented reality world. The application that they're working on is completely in the area of field service technicians, and it's, it's totally cool. So again, I've mentioned apprenticeships are really important to this education and workforce development trend. You can see around the country there's some specific states that get, that understand that they've really got to focus their education investment dollars on apprenticeship programs. So states like South Carolina, Minnesota, uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, they're getting much more heavily involved in apprenticeships. And why is that? Because we've seen a lot of foreign direct investment in those states from automotive and aerospace companies, and the workforce has to keep pace with those companies in order to be successful. Again, I think it's going to be a mode of where we're all in continuous life learning. Anybody know what's driving that number right there? $1.5 trillion. You know what that represents? That would be the amount of student debt that we have in this country. And it's the equivalent of about $35,000 per individual. So our message is uh, take a different path. You know, right now, guidance counselors are incentivized to get every student possible to go from high school to a four-year college. And we just have to change our mindset. The correct path for some individuals is to go technical school, community college, do an apprenticeship, get a job with a manufacturing company, be successful in your career. You know, the message that we have a difficult time getting across to the general public is that manufacturing is a really well-paying industry. And these, these jobs are typically in environments where all the equipment is very high tech and they're nice, pleasant working environments, not my father's manufacturing, right? So that's really important. Um, shouldn't go unnoticed that on the 2020 campaign trail, we're already hearing things from both sides of the aisle on the fact that we need to erase student loan debt and make free college available to everyone. Well, that's an argument, but you know, it's not, just not gonna be sustainable for us as taxpayers to erase a $1.5 trillion in debt. So we'll buy everything you hear from the campaign trail. And we need to set students on a different pathway. That's going to be the only solution. Otherwise, that debt's just going to keep increasing. Do you know that 10% of that $1.5 trillion in student loan debt is held by people in their 50s? either a combination of they've had that debt themselves their entire lives, I know a few people like that, or they've taken loans out from their own children and they're, they're carrying some of that debt. So this is a problem that we need to solve as a country. We can do that by encouraging more people to uh, go to community college and tech school. So it's all about changing perceptions and careers in manufacturing. And we use the Student Summit at IMTS as our biggest platform to be able to do that on behalf of our industry. We've been doing a student summit at IMTS since 1998, and last year I saw some photos of the first one we did. I know you, many of you have been to McCormick Place. There was a photo in a ballroom with a teacher and a podium, and there were probably 50 people in the room, and that's what we call the Education Student Summit in 1998. Last year, we had 24,000 plus students, teachers, administrators, parent chaperones, first robotics teams, next robotics teams, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, homeschool parents and, and their children attend IMTS through the Student Summit. We had students attend IMTS from a record 46 different states. And uh, we also hit a record number of 7,500 community college and college students attend IMTS through the Student Summit, which means that they get to see the other 1.4 million square feet in space too. Um, so we are you know, trying to grow an audience. 
that's nationwide. One of these days I'll get Hawaii and Alaska to come to the student summit too, but 46 states is pretty good penetration around the country. We work really closely with organizations like First Robotics, and if you're interested in mentoring a first team but you've never done it, I'd encourage you to, to do that in your spare time. They really need volunteers and, and mentors. At the Student Summit at IMTS 2014, I was honored to uh, have Dean Kamen, the founder of First Robotics, do a keynote for um, the students who came to our summit. Working with Dean and his team all along, they told us we had 20, 20 minutes of Dean's time to do a keynote and get out of the building. He had other meetings to go to. Dean was so impressed by what he saw at the Student Summit at IMTS, he stayed for two and a half hours, canceled his entire afternoon, and just engaged with all the students who were attending. So we do a lot of work with FIRST Robotics they actually do their season launch at IMTS with us, and it's a great organization to be engaged with. So if you want a mentor, I'd encourage you to do that. We, through IMTS, support the ecosystem within the community of Chicago. So we go there, we do a trade show once every two years. Um, some of the manufacturers like Mazak spend a little bit more time than a week while we're there because they have to set up and take down, and, and we're there quite a bit. I've been to Chicago eight times this year already because we're highly engaged with that community, as I mentioned. So I'm working with um, local community outreach folks like Project Sincere, Girls Who Code, and others to assure that we get students coming and seeing all the latest and greatest in, in manufacturing technology. We simply have to impress upon this next generation that it's cool to have a job in our so again, I meant to get involved. If you're doing something with the FIRST Robotics team, I applaud you. Um, we use the Student Summit at IMTS as our opportunity to give back. So we do a Miles from Manufacturing 5K run at IMTS. If you've never been involved with that, I encourage you to do that. The sponsorship funding and the, and the runner funding that we, we get for that enables me to do things like donate 3D printers and robotics kits to schools in Chicago and other areas. And wherever AMT does an event around the country, we typically leave something behind or in that community. So I do a lot of donations. Uh, this year, we've already decided that we're gonna triple the budget uh, for donations, um, 3D printers and other things like that. We may even do something in the area. AOD. I want to take a few minutes to uh, talk about MIMS and where we're going with this. You know, as technologies transform, so does the manufacturing workforce, so, so does the education programs for workers coming from this next generation. That, again, is what you typically think of when you think of a, a MIMS certification. We do a lot for CNC machinists, production technicians, and field service technicians but we're now developing new industry recognized credentials in these important areas. We've already launched uh, development, it's funded to begin developing credentials for Industry 4.0. These are all industry supported and industry recognized credentials, so we're working with the top manufacturers in those areas to join the technical work groups as volunteers to help design the standards and develop the credentials. Uh, Boeing came to us a couple of years ago and asked us to develop a new metrology technician standard. So that work is under development. It'll probably be finished by this fall. So if you need folks to know how to run a CMM, know that this is coming into the educational space very soon. We're also working with ARM, the Advanced Robotics Manufacturing Institute, to develop a standard for robotic technicians. And, and then lastly, uh, an 80-20 stackable credential. So NIMS already has a standard and credentials for CNC machinists, but what we're, we're moving to is to give 
schools the ability to train on specific uh, control types. So a Nasatrol, for instance, uh, any school that trains specifically on those controls could produce students who come out of school with credential. So you as employers know that they're competent and ready to run machines in your shop uh, because they've got that stackable. <coughs> Segue to a project that has been uh, taking up a great deal of my time recently. Uh, in 2017, there's a presidential executive order that came down uh, addressing the need for U.S. defense machining and manufacturing capability and sustainability. So my colleagues at AMT did a lot of the research on analytics. Where are we as a country on our ability to produce defense related parts for the aerospace industry and that sort of thing, um, even submarines and things like that. Uh, part of this executive order led to uh, obviously making sure that we have a workforce coming out, going in to work for companies that specialize in producing aerospace and, and defense parts. So we're working with IBAS, the industrial base, analysis and sustainment program to develop a new five axis machining skills competition for schools that we've introduced this year. We've begun a proof of concept round of the competition and we are moving towards uh, developing more student programs in schools around five axis. If um, you get any of the forecasting information that AMT puts out there. We just did our forecasting conference in Cleveland uh, in early October, and the Gardner Business Intelligence Capital Spending Survey for 2020 <coughs> states that there's gonna be an 18% increase in five axis vertical machine sales in 2020, mainly in shops that deal with aerospace, machining, and a little bit in medical device machining as well, and a 24% increase in five axis machining uh, in the horizontal machines. So really indicative of where the market is going with five axis machining. The bad news is that we've identified there's only 100 schools around the country that are teaching true five axis machining in their programs. So we're trying to elevate those programs, make this more widely available, in the educational community so that they are producing the product that industry actually needs with regard to five axis. I'm gonna step aside here and play a quick video introducing you to Project MFG. educational programs and careers in manufacturing technology. Introducing Project MFG. Project MFG is a series of competitions for post-secondary students that will eventually reach across the country and is designed to show off the advanced skills needed in manufacturing technology education and careers. Project MFG tests students' manufacturing technology skills and business acumen as teams complete tasks during a timed event. A 50-50 public-private partnership among the Department of Defense, Office of the Secretary of Defense, Industrial Base Analysis and Sustainability, AMT, the Association for Manufacturing Technology, and other industry stakeholders, Project MFG aims to help close the technical skills gap by promoting positive perceptions about advanced manufacturing education and careers, accelerating new entrants into the workforce, and aligning industry and defense requirements while elevating educational programs. The skills gap is a well-documented issue facing U.S. manufacturing companies across all industries, from auto, aerospace, and defense, to computer science, IT, retail, and hospitality. With transformative, smart manufacturing technologies taking hold, the breadth of the skills gap is expected to grow even larger. The national conversation around STEM education has encouraged investments career and technical education, dual credit <coughs> programs, and apprenticeships, as well as workforce development and two-year programs that lead to industry-recognized certificates and degrees. 
more needs to be done rapidly in order to get the U.S. to actual full employment. In 2017, a presidential executive order was signed to address U.S. defense machining and manufacturing capability and sustainability. Project MFG Next Generation Manufacturing Challenge was conceived. With only a few months of runway and planning, a proof of concept round of competitions codenamed Project MSG launched in April of 2019, with teams of students competing in an industry-developed five-axis CNC plus welding competition, ranging from design, programming and business planning, to quality assurance and cost effectiveness. The speed at which Project MFG was developed is indicative of what's possible when federal policy unites with business and industry leaders to accomplish a goal. It's clear that while industry needs machinists who have the ability to manufacture multi-axis parts, school curriculum was not aligned to provide credentialed, competent individuals to meet the industry needs. Were schools intimidated by a five-axis machining competition? You bet, but not all were. We quickly saw teachers, professors, administrators, and students begin to rise to the challenge, especially among schools who compete in the SkillsUSA National Championships for CNC milling and turning. The Project MFG competitions kicked off with a part design that resembles a DNA strand. Because manufacturing is in our DNA as a nation and always has been. The next rounds of the Project MFG competitions will be held throughout this fall and spring leading up to a national competition at the Smart Force Student Summit at IMTS 2020. Watch these moments at projectmfg.com as they become a movement to inspire students to pursue a manufacturing career, close the skills gap, keep the U.S. a world leader in manufacturing. Hudson Valley Community College in New York and Detroit area. And then next week I'm going to Danville, Virginia for another round of Project MFG. There will be three or four more competitions in December and January. And then as we get to the end of the school year, uh, we're going to have another round of invitationals for schools so that you can bring students to Project MFG National Championship at the Student Summit at IMTS. So if you visit IMTS, I encourage you to come down and, and see that. By the time we get to IMTS, there's already a plan in place to add some mechatronics and automation to the competition, as well as additive manufacturing. So it's gonna be a lot more stuff that the student teams are gonna be required to know and learn. Um, likely, the Project MFG will roll into a Skills USA national competition eventually, probably by 2021 when we work out all the kinks and, um, and Skills USA has more room to dedicate to another competition uh, when they move to Atlanta in 2021. Does anybody work with Skills USA? Are you familiar with them? Do you hire a lot of students who come out of that program? Yes, no, maybe. It, I encourage you to, to work in your local communities with your high schools, community colleges, look for those schools that are doing CNC milling and turning uh, championships already. Those are the best students coming out of any systems in the country. Okay. I think that's about my time, although I do have time for questions if anyone wants to ask anything or, or see me later. It's, it's all. Thank you for your time.